What happens when you die? Today, we ask the existential question right here on Debt Free and 30. This is Debt Free and 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Ted, welcome back. Today's topic, what happens to my debt when I die? When so, you die? Yes, when I die. So we're going <laughs> to we're going to start with the simple scenario and then we'll we'll add some we'll nuances add to, to it. it. Okay. Exactly. So the easy scenario is I have no assets, I owe money on a credit card, it's just in my name and I die. What right. happens? Well, hopefully somebody's there to take care of you, <laughs> to, to put you in the ground or cremate you however you want, but as far as your creditors are concerned, they're probably out of luck. That's that. There you go. And so thanks for watching, everybody. And that's, Show's over. Can that's, I go do something that's else That's pretty much it. I mean, yes, there would be obviously great gnashing of teeth and a huge funeral. Well, so people need to understand. They've got a claim against your estate, right? Uh, but your estate has nothing. So it's not that the, that the debts are, well, I mean, they're out of luck because there's nothing for them to fight over. There's nothing for them to get. So even if you've got somebody looking after your estate, so you've died and there's an executor, somebody looking after a will if you had one, if there's nothing there... It's a blood from a stone scenario. There's nothing there. So right. so let's say that... Um, You're going to say there's something there now, right? Well, we're, that'll be the second scenario. <laughs> but, I mean, you and I get this question yeah. at least once a week. It's right. a very but, common scenario. Wow, well, because we deal with a lot of seniors. Yeah, and or we're dealing with the kids of the seniors. Yep. So, okay, my, my parent has these debts. They're not dead yet, but they're, you know, 70 years old, 80 years old. They're retired. Right. And they owe this money on a credit card. They have no assets. So what's your advice in that scenario for the parent? Right. So for the parent, I mean, if you, you've got the ability to continue to make the payments, you certainly have the option to do that. But once you're dead, you can't be making the payments. And there's no reason for, for anyone else to try and make those payments for you. So it's, if there's money in your estate, they're entitled to try and claim some of that money. And it, it's almost always who gets to it first. Uh, but it's... Yeah. So if, if I've got... Uh, so my my parent has no assets, but they're getting calls from this collector and they're 75 years old. Right. Then, you know, my advice to that person, you know, like yeah. you say, if you can pay it, great. Change your phone number. Change your phone number. Because if you don't pay it, well, I guess they can take you to court and they can sue you. They can't garnish your wages because you don't have any. Right. Can they garnish your CPP? Nope. Can they, well, yeah, and you got nothing else. Yeah, the only debt you need to be afraid of if you're, once you're on a pension is a government debt. So if you're getting CPP and you owe income taxes, they can legally reduce your, your CPP to recover that money. Right. And it's rare that they do. And if they do, it's a nominal amount. Because, well, to start with, your CPP isn't a huge number anyways. You're not getting right. 10000 bucks a month in CPP. Uh, I talked to a gentleman last week who is getting, I think, $800 a month in CPP because of how much he'd worked. Right. So, okay, maybe the government might claw back a couple hundred bucks of it. I've never heard him claw back more than like a hundred. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a big thing. So, so okay, the very simple scenario for your, if you're a senior, um, well, in fact, I guess if you're anybody who has no income that is garnishable. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, this could apply to people on a, on a CPP disability or on ODSP or on Ontario Works. If you've got a, f a form of income that isn't that, the, that a creditor can't attach to or to attack, then one of the strategies always is just, okay, ignore them. So then when I'm dead, well, then I'm definitely ignoring them. Right. Because they they can't be calling me. Okay. Well, and so the people looking after your estate, if somebody is, need to understand that that was a decision you made because you didn't have to. And so they don't have to worry about it, too. I mean, that's kids are most often worried about, am I going to get stuck paying off of dad's debts? So how do I know if I'm going to get stuck paying off dad's debts? What, what could make me liable for dad's well, debts? So the most common reason is it's a joint account. So, and this is it's usually it's spouses as opposed to parents and children, although that's becoming more common because children are getting copies of their parents' credit cards so they can keep track of what they're spending. Uh, but let's say it's a spouse. So John dies. Jane had a joint credit card with him. Jane is now on the hook for John's credit card because it was one they both had. So what does joint mean? Joint means you are joint and severally liable for the debt. It's, both, it's in both of your names. So there's 100% of debt there. If John can't pay it off, then Jane's on the hook for 100% of it. And so how would I know if it's joint? Can I look at my statement? Yeah, like the most common way you see that it's joint is that both names appear on the account. So if, if John is getting a credit card bill 
and there's only his name on it, then it's unlikely that Jane is joint on that debt because they list everything there so everybody knows who's legally responsible. Yeah, and so if if Jane is worried because John is sick and he's probably going to die and she's going to be liable for it, then my advice to her would be, well, look at the statement. Is your name on it? If it is, then you're liable for it. If your name isn't on it, you could phone up the credit card company and say, hey, I'd like to know about my account. Right. And if they go, yeah, we're not going to tell you. It's not your account. Okay, well, then I guess That's I guess pretty no. Clear. So you explained what joint is. Yeah. What is supplemental mean? So supplemental means that someone has charging rights on another person's account. So they're not liable for the debt. It's, a, it's an accessory card. It's an additional card. Um, it's They're reasonably common in uh, spousal situations. Sometimes people are getting them for their kids as well. But basically, your name might appear on the credit card, but the actual bill and statement goes to the primary person responsible for the account. Right. And the two most common examples would be um, I give my spouse a supplemental card on my account or vice versa. The other common example, as you said, so my kid is going off to university, so I get a credit card in my name. And I put my kid on as a supplemental card holder and, uh, you know, make sure the limits on the card's 500 bucks or something. Be very careful about that. Because you don't want your kid racking it up. But I understand maybe my kid has some emergency needs access to quick cash. So in that scenario, the reason it's a supplemental card is my kid doesn't qualify for a credit card. Right. They have no income. They're going to school, whatever. So based on my credit, I get the card. It's a supplemental card. They're not legally responsible for it. Right. So... Under that scenario, when I die, my kid is not responsible for that supplemental card. And they will lose the card, obviously. Because I'm dead. Right. So there you go. Okay, so we've talked about the simple scenario where I've got nothing. Now the next scenario is I've got something. Mm -hmm. So then what do we do under, under that scenario? So let's say I've got a credit card at ABC Bank. Right. That's not a real bank. It's just something I made up. There are a couple of banks that are close to ABC. That's true, but I I made that up because we don't want to get sued. I owe money on the credit card, but I also have cash in the bank. So let's say I've got 5,000 bucks cash in my savings account, and I also owe $5,000 on my credit card at that bank. I die. Right. What happens? Well, so the first thing you got to watch for is the bank has something called the right of set off. So if you've got an account with money in it and a debt that you owe them, they're allowed to take the money out of the account with the money in it to pay off the debt that you owe them but if you start missing payments. So in the first scenario we talked about where we said, well, you don't have any wages, they can't garnish you, you right. stop paying, it doesn't matter. That doesn't work if there's money in the bank account. Correct. So these, I mean, the, the most typical example is there's money in the checking account. There isn't a savings account, but there's money in the checkings and you miss your payments. I mean, lots of people have experienced this. The bank goes in and takes their payment. Well, if they find out you're dead, they'll go in and they'll take all the money because the right of set off allows them to do that. Yeah, they have the legal right to do that. And if you're a senior, and again, we're talking about seniors being more likely to die than non-seniors, I guess, because that's how math works. The senior likely is getting their pension income deposited into the bank account every month. That's right. Wherever it's coming from, boom. Either the end of the month because it's the government, or maybe it's the middle of the month because it's some past employer. But and so the money is is going into the account. So under that scenario, it's not as simple as say, ah, don't worry about it, right? Because there might be there. Now, what if then I have some kind of other asset? So let's say, um, well, let's take the scenario. I've got. In your example, I got twenty thousand in my checking account, right? But I have sixty thousand dollars worth of credit card debt, and let's say I'm dead. Okay. Now what happens? Well, and so um, depending on what you've put in place to look after your estate, somebody's going to be responsible for looking after things. And by that I mean, so that twenty thousand dollars is sitting there, unless somebody takes control of it. The creditors might start trying to do things like get court orders to access it themselves. That's pretty messy if they go that route. Usually there's an executor for the estate that's going to look after cleaning things up. And the executor's first responsibility is to see, does the estate have any bills or debts that I've got to clear up before I can deal with the will, before I can start handing out this person's assets? So in this particular scenario, there's 20000 bucks. Let's say it's in a TFSA or something. Yeah, whatever. There's $60,000 worth of credit card debt. You're the executor of this person's estate. So you can't just take the money out of the TFSA and pay the credit card because there isn't enough. Right. So what do you do? Well, and that's the decision. You've got to 
You can try to negotiate settlements with them yourself. You have the right to file something called a consumer proposal for a deceased, deceased person. It's pretty uncommon to do. Um, mostly you serve them notice that there's dead and hope that they do nothing. So, so I need, bad for yeah, advice. well, and <clears throat> you're right. So I'm the executor of the estate. Um, and there's 20,000 bucks of assets there. So I could send a letter to the credit card companies and say, well, he's dead. So yeah. And they may just say, okay, fine. We're going to write it off. It's not a big enough number. Right. But I can't take that $20,000 that's in the TFSA and distribute it to the heirs, can I? You can't, because if you do, the heirs are liable to those debts for whatever amount of money that they received. Because your first responsibility is make sure that the estate is clean, the creditors have been dealt with, and then the second responsibility is to the will. So your options then would be like you say, well, let's see if I can make a settlement with the creditors. Okay, I got 20000 bucks here. Here, I'll give you each 5000 bucks or whatever. You could, the estate itself could go bankrupt. Yeah, it has the legal right to do that. And the advantage of that is, well, it cleans everything up. Well, and effectively, you're paying somebody else to deal with the problem. So the trustee then takes the 20000 pays out the creditors, they don't get all their money, and right. they're done. And the estate could also do a consumer proposal. They could. It's, it would be more likely you'd file the bankruptcy. But because what's the point? Right. Yeah, because the only point of it is to distribute the money that's there, just as easy to do it in a bankruptcy or, yep. or through a proposal. And the in a proposal, the creditors would likely accept it because, well, the guy's dead. Getting nothing anyway. Getting nothing anyways. And then it's it's cleaned it up. If you just choose to do nothing, well, then the money sits in the TFSA forever. Yeah, I mean, the thing to watch out for is that if you're in a TFSA, it's held by a bank. And odds are that that person has debts with that bank. TFSAs are not protected under the law. So it's not a trust account. So the bank is going to grab their money first. So if you know there's a bunch of debts that you want to potentially deal with, uh, and it's money in a TFSA or a checking account, you might want to get that money out of there. Uh, if you're concerned with controlling it. Because if you leave it with the bank, they're going to use that set-off rule to go after it themselves. So that's the planning point then. So right. so let's say I'm you know pretty sick and I think I'm not going to be here in six months. Right. Which means you'll have to take over the podcast, I guess. <laughs> you get to sit in this chair then. You poor people. I'll and come then, up with funny topics. And then you'll get the cue cards. Because well, today, once again, that. just like last <laughs> week, no cue cards for Ted. No cue cards for Ted. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm dead. Or I, I know I'm going to be, I think I'm going to be dead in the next six months. I right. have 20000 bucks in my TFSA. I've got $60,000 with a credit card debt, of which a chunk of it is at the same bank that the TFSA is at. Right. I don't want to be a burden on my children when I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So what should I be doing now? Right. So it's, it's now it's time to move the money from the bank that's got both assets and liabilities. So, you, so that you end up with a bank that you owe money to and another bank that you have money in that nobody can just immediately access. Or move it to a joint account with one of your kids so that they already have access to that account immediately without having to go through the estate. And there's all sorts of complicated ways that you can put your affairs in order. Yeah, and I guess the other answer would be, well, if you really don't want to leave the burden to the kids, they have no legal burden, they don't right. have to pay it, but you could file the proposal now and say, okay, fine, here you go, everybody, I'm going to kick the 20 grand into the proposal, pay everybody off. Yep. I guess you've also got to consider what are the expenses when I'm dead? Right. Who's going to look after your internment, the, uh, the, the stone that goes on the grave, or if you're going to be cremated? I mean, how, who's going to deal with all this stuff? Have you actually put plans in place for that? We're not going to help you with those plans because, you know. A rocket ship into the sun. There you go. That would be a good I'm, one. Yep. I don't know how much that costs. You and Elon Musk. Exactly. We'll, we'll go together. Well, when you die, there's this thing called the CPP death benefit. Yep. Do you have any idea how that works? Well, and so the somebody has to apply for it. But usually, uh, whatever funeral home you are dealing with to help the, the memorial aspects of it, it's either burying or cremation or whatever, will apply for it on the estate's behalf. It's a $2,500 benefit from the government to help cover those costs, assuming that you meet the required minimums. It's, what is it, 10 years worth of work yeah, or something? Yeah, so you had to have actually contributed to CPP. Makes so sense. if you worked for your whole life, well, then, yes, there's probably a, a CPP uh, death benefit there. 
And I'll put a link in the show notes on YouTube to exactly how it works. There's, you know, of course, it's the government. So there's these complicated rules. You either had to have contributed for 10 years or in the last three years, you had to do this and that and the other thing and the other thing and the other thing. But it ends up being 2,500 bucks. So Funeral homes know all that stuff. Right. And so since the cost of the funeral process is probably 2,500 or more, Mm -hmm. that becomes the first chunk that, that pays for it. Now, there's also something called the CPP Survivor's Pension. Yep. Which... It's kind of exactly what it sounds like. If I die and my spouse was, or whoever my survivor is, presumably in most cases it would be the spouse, never contributed to CPP, then they would be eligible to, if assuming they're 65 or older, to continue receiving 60% of what I was getting. And my guess is that every year that number is getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And if my spouse was already eligible for CPP, well, then they're getting nothing because they're right. already getting it. So again, it's a kind of a, a convoluted thing. So I think the planning point here is to look ahead and go, okay, what's the situation going to look like? Right. So what assets do you have? Um, now, some assets are more complicated than others to deal with, sure. like a house, for example. Yep. So I guess you could say, well, okay, I'm not going to be here much longer. I'm going to either sell the house or sell it to my kids. Yeah, it depends. So, I mean, here in Ontario where we are, uh, if two people are on title of the house and one of them dies, the other one automatically gets the house. And so I don't know how that affects the the first party's will or the estate's ability to access any of that equity to pay off any debts they might have. So you better talk to a lawyer. Better talk to a lawyer people. about that better, one. Better talk to a lawyer. I mean, we're looking mostly at the simple scenarios where somebody has a bunch of debt. Yeah, it's credit cards, pay Credit loans, cards, don't have, any, don't have any assets. Um, and therefore, I mean, the, the key point I think we're driving home here is you are responsible for what you have signed for. Yep. Doesn't matter if you're married to someone. Doesn't matter right. if you. Uh, That's right. Your spouse is not automatically responsible for your debts. Your executor is not personally responsible for your debts. Just your deceased estate is. Which is why we talked about joint and supplemental. Is there any difference between joint and co-signed? So co-signed means you've guaranteed the debt. Your name might not appear on a bill if you guarantee a debt for somebody else. So you, the trick you suggested of calling in and saying, "Can I have information on this account?" That's a pretty good one. And that would work. So if it's a credit card, well, then you've both got a credit card. If it's a joint credit card, you've both got a card with your name on it. Your name's going to, but if it was, let's say a line of credit or a loan or a car loan or anything like that, then yes, your name wouldn't appear on the statement because it's not your debt. The the other person's would. So I think really what you got to be doing is, is looking at everything and going, okay, so Who's in what's name? It's it's really making a an inventory. Yep. And of course, as you know, I talked about this in that <laughs> that wonderful book. Time straight, to get update straight, that, isn't it? Yeah, it is probably second edition. Uh, second edition, <clears throat> and it'll be twice as much money because of inflation. So you remember, of course, myth number eighteen, which right. is I am immortal, and on page one hundred and sixty-seven, I have the death checklist. <laughs> which, of course, was the highlight of the book for many people. So right. I talk about, you know, cover the basics, life insurance, that sort of thing. Um, and life insurance, well, that's different, right? So life insurance, it depends on who the beneficiary of the policy is. If the beneficiary is your estate, then that's money that's being paid effectively to you as a dead person that your creditors can access. If the beneficiary is anybody else, then the money is going elsewhere and can't be accessed. So I should leave my my beneficiary of my life insurance should be my spouse Spouse. or my kid or whatever it should not be the estate right because if it's the estate it goes into the pot and that pot then has to be used to pay my creditors and even if you don't have any debts it shouldn't be your estate because then the the lawyers are going to fight over it so they're going to get a fee instead of the money going to whomever it is that you're hoping to have that legacy remembrance of. You're not a fan of lawyers. I'm um, not a fan of lawyers. Which is why <laughs> the next, by the way. The, it, we are. <laughs> the The next thing on the, the death checklist. checklist is a will. Mm-hmm. And that's obviously a way to specify, okay, here's who, yeah. who, here's who gets what. I apologize in advance. Where there's a will, there's a way. Oh! So if you've got a will, there's a way to distribute your assets. If there's no will, there's no way. <laughs> We'll edit that out. Yeah, we, 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 that won't make the final cut. It's just too cut. tacky. It's too, too. Um, <laughs> not as bad as my joke about my my wonderful memorial at the start of the show. Right. So the other things that you should be considering are a power of attorney for personal care and a power of attorney for property. What does that mean? Now, so power of attorney for personal care is if you can't make decisions about your health, somebody else will make them for you. If it's about property, it's, well, okay, so this person can 
pay bills, liquidate assets. They can they can do whatever you had the power to do for the things that you own. And we said we explained that it's possible for an estate, a dead person, to go bankrupt. Yep. A lot easier if there is a power of attorney in place. Yep. Because that person can then, on behalf make of the dead decision. person, make that decision and file the bankruptcy or proposal. Right. The other second big item on my death checklist is to keep your spouse in the loop. Yep. And it's not just the stuff we talked about. It's like, okay, uh, I do the banking and I'm now dead. Right. Does my spouse have the password to the secret bank account and all that kind of stuff? Yep. Well, and do they actually know how many different bank accounts you have? Because knowing you, they're oh, probably all over the place. 47 different <laughs> bank accounts and... Uh, Actually, I, I have one. Just one? But yeah, the but you're right. And like, how do the bills get paid? Are they all right. coming out electronically? Do I have to do them at a certain time of month? Um, so, and more practically, okay, I'm dead and my spouse needs to buy groceries tomorrow. Right. Can it, they access the bank yeah. account? Like in, and how does how does that all work? So things like bank accounts, investment accounts, regular monthly bills, irregular bills, you know, like the annual payment for your car insurance or whatever, um, a contact list. So who's the plumber we call? Yep. Um, I should get my wife to write that down because she's in charge of all that stuff at, at my house. <laughs> right. And then and then anything else. So again, it's it's looking at the big picture and understanding what uh, what potentially you you may or may not need to do. So, um, so okay, let's finish it up then with the the very practical advice then. So an uh, a child an adult child calls you up and says. Um, I've been, you know, helping my parent go through all their finances and they've got a bunch of debt. Right. So what are the questions that you then ask that adult child okay. on behalf of the parent? So the first question is, so how are, how's your parents supporting themselves? What kind of income do they have? And it's almost always, well, they're on pensions. And it makes a difference if they're employment pensions or work pensions or some kind of survivor benefit insurance. Because if depending on the type of income they have, there are different answers for what you have to do to prepare for this. Second is, do they own anything? So have they got a house? Have they got a cottage? Have they got a car collection? You know, have they have they got money in a RSP, an R R R F, R R F Registered Retirement Investment Fund, all that sort of stuff. You're trying to get a what we're doing is a an assessment of where they're at financially. And then of course it's let's talk about the debts. How much debt is it? Who is it to? Is it to the same bank that they're dealing with? So they've got, you know, a ABC bank credit card and a line of credit. And that's where they keep their savings and their checking account. All right, well, we need to take steps about all that stuff. And is the parent prepared to deal with any of this stuff themselves? So you're concerned as the child, but if your parent doesn't want to talk to me and you don't have power of attorney, then probably this conversation isn't going anywhere. Yeah, and even if you have power of attorney, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm probably not going to be spending yeah. a whole lot of time on it because your parent is still with us. Well, and I mean, we all talk to, to people about our health. So we'll tell people if we had a cancer diagnosis, if we're going in for, you know, colonoscopy or God knows whatever else is coming up. We don't talk to people about our money. And parents are almost all really reluctant to talk to their children about their money because it just, it violates that whole, I am the provider ethos. I looked after you. I'm not telling you where I'm at now. It's none of your damn business. So you've got to bridge that gap. And trying to assess over the phone whether the child's had that conversation yet is one of the more difficult aspects of this for us. Yeah. Once a parent, always a parent. Right. And so even if you're 85 and your kid is 65, you are still the parent. And so it's hard to flip it around and say, okay, I need some, some help here. Some things you just don't want to talk about. Yeah. You just, you just don't want to do it. So your advice then for the adult child is to gather what information you can yep. and ask these questions of your, of your parent. And, and it may be more useful to try to convince the parent that, you know what, I don't want to pry into this stuff, mom, dad, but you should call this guy to talk to them about it. Um, they might be reluctant to do that, but they're more likely to do that than they are to tell you what their financial situation is. Yeah. And I think the adult child says to the parent, look, you know, I, I want to make sure things are easy for you right. in your remaining years. We don't want stress. We don't want stress. Let's see if we can't uh, work out some kind of, some kind of plan. And is it possible in your example where the person's getting a pension income to be dealing with the debts from a pension income? even though they can't well, be can. sued or garnished. So uh, anyone has the right to either file bankruptcy or a proposal, even if they're 
form of income can't be garnished or attached. Uh, and there are times when it makes sense because if nothing else, it you're trying to proactively deal with a situation before it gets worse. Uh, it, that becomes a question of cash flow. I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be setting aside three, four, five hundred dollars a month to deal with debts if somebody's only living on fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars a month of pensions. Yeah, so it's each situation is unique. Well, and we've had adult children who say to us, "Look, I understand I'm not legally responsible for this, and I understand when they die, the debts are gone, but it's causing them some stress. So I would like to help fund a proposal. I can kick in a couple hundred bucks a month, right?" Um, and it's because I've been helping my parent to the tune of 700 bucks a month paying their bills because they've only got a limit. It's just easier for me. I'm willing to do that. So you and I would have the conversation with them saying, well, legally, you don't have to. Right. Legally, you could tell your mother or your father, don't worry about it. And legally, you shouldn't. Right. So if you're going to do this, you'd give the money to them and the payment would come from them. There's a pretty, it's not used very often, but there's a section of the law that basically says if your creditors know that you're paying somebody else's bills and they get used to that and then that person stops paying, you're not liable for the debt because the expectation was you were paying them. Yeah. And whether that's legally accurate or not, practically speaking, if you've given them access to your bank account and they're taking the money right. out every month, they're going to keep taking it. They're going to keep taking it. So in some cases, even though legally you're not on the hook for your parents' debt, Practically speaking, you're supporting them now. It would right. be cheaper to deal with the debts. Okay, fine. Yep. But when you come in and talk to us, I think we're going to be pretty hardcore on the side of you don't legally have to deal with this. Right. So do you really want to be forking out the money to do it? Now, sometimes the adult child says, look, I'm in okay shape myself. Yeah, a couple hundred afford. bucks a month. It's no big deal. In fact, once the proposal is accepted, I'm just going to you know, draw write on my savings, pay the thing, write a check and be done with it. So, yeah. okay, under that scenario, then, then that's fine. But again, key points here to wrap it up. You are only responsible for what you have legally signed for. That's right. You can only be held accountable for debts you've incurred yourself. I guess the only other topic we didn't cover would be a secured debt. So my you know, parent has a car loan. Yep. How is that affected in a death situation? Well, so the, the first concern of the finance company or bank that's got the loan against the car is, is somebody going to continue to pay us? Otherwise, we're going to come and take the car. So- as as the adult child, I could say, well, you know what? I kind of like that 1976 Grand Marquis. Oh, well, more common is, I think my mom would like to be able to keep the car. Dad's gone now, but she's got to be able to get around. Is that the right car for her? Or would you go get her a different car? But that's mm -hmm. a more common scenario. But, and I guess if they're dead, I could keep making the car payment. And nobody would know. Nobody would know, <laughs> but the car isn't in my name. Right. The loan isn't in my name. You're going to have issues at some point, renewing license plates and other things. Well, insurance, how does that work yep. when it's not my car? So again, that would be a scenario where if it appears that, you know, death is imminent, then perhaps it's better to either say, okay, fine, we're giving up the car anyway, so it doesn't matter. Take some steps. But take some steps, transfer the car, switch the loan, whatever. Right. Um, I mean, we're recording this in June of 2022. Is that where we are? Correct. Um, and neither one of us is dead. Neither one of us is dead. Um, well, that we know of. That's right. This isn't a lot. So we can't comment on first-hand right. experience. This is a lot. Isn't a live <laughs> broadcast, but used car prices have been, you know, sky high. Are they easing off a little bit now? Or are they nope. still the sky inventories high? are still really short, so prices are still stupid. So if you're got a car that the elderly person isn't driving anyways, well, maybe it can be returned. You know, pay off the loan. Maybe that yep. can be extricated. It's always nice to keep things simple. So that at the end, okay, we've dealt with all those those kinds of things. Right. But again, this was this was a podcast about debt, and the answer is you do not, you are not, re you are not responsible for something you didn't sign for. Just try to remember that, folks. Pr pretty much as simple as that. And even though the collection agent, you know, has your number as the reference, and they're calling yep. you and saying you have to pay it, you are not responsible for it. Simple That's as right. that. Any final comments you'd like to make about death? Uh, we're all going to live forever, so I'm sure this won't be a it's a moot to point. That's it's right. a moot point. I keep to telling my kids that. Yeah, there you go. The uh, so again, you think? I mean, you want to help your parent? Fantastic. Right. Or you are the parent. You don't want to leave a burden to your children. Fantastic. Yep. But it is not. You are not legally responsible for any debt you didn't sign for. Yeah. And, and so you want some simple advice? If you're curious about any of this, 
call somebody and have the conversation over the phone. I mean, that's the hardest part of this process. Decide that you are going to share your story with somebody else so they can give you some good advice. Yeah. And if you don't want to talk to a licensed insolvency trustee, well, talk to a lawyer that deals with wills and estate planning. They will be able to answer all these questions for you as well. So. Right. So there you go. That is our episode on death. Thank you all for uh, listening and watching. I will put a link in the show notes to the CPP death benefit and the CPP survivor's pension so you can fact check to see if we got our numbers right. And of course, straight talk on your money. I mean, everybody's reading that on Kindle already anyways, but it's it's there as well. So that is our show for today. Until next week, assuming we are both still Not here. Dead. Probably won't be you on the show next week, but Ted will right. be back at some point. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. For Ted Michaelis, that was Debt Free in 30. Look at that. Exactly. Well, let's do a quick tip.